All right, folks, welcome to the Starkle Planetarium. How's everybody doing tonight? Really good. All right. I have heard that it is the second largest planetarium in the state of Illinois from very reputable sources. All right. Well, folks, this is our first edition of the Kaler Science Lecture Series, and we have another pair of attendees. Come on in, folks. All right. Thank you very much. Go ahead and find some seats. We've got plenty available for you all. All right. Um, so our speakers for this evening are three Parkland College students and alumni. They recently participated in the Phenotypic Plasticity Research Experience for Community College Students Program. Okay, I did get all those words correct. Yay. Okay, um, we actually have our advisors of this program here this evening, professors Two, two advisors, correct? Yes, I was going to say both of them. That's right. Professors Nate Schroeder of the University of Illinois and Britt Carlson from Parkland College. Um, I'm going to leave it to Britt, Dr. Carlson, to introduce our three speakers. Okay? So feel free to come up and you have the remote all set there. You see that your PowerPoint presentation is ready to go. Um, so take it away. Thank you, Eric. Thank you guys for joining us. Uh, we have three really accomplished, amazing Parkland alumni and current students who are also freaking out a little bit, but you guys are all really excited to hear about what they're going to talk about, right? Yeah. Okay. So um, I want to tell you just a little bit about the program. So we run Prex, which is, Eric said it perfectly, it's all up there. It is a paid summer research experience for community college students. It's a biology research experience. And the students spend six weeks kind of getting research ready, uh, six days, sorry, getting research ready at Parkland. And then they go and do a research immersion where they're fully integrated into a research lab at the University of Illinois. Um, and in addition, this summer we teamed up with a research uh, group, a large research collaborative group at the University of Illinois called GEMS. And through that we were actually able to host a couple more students. So two of our speakers tonight actually were, uh, they fully integrated into PREX, but then they also got support from the GEMS program. Uh, so just to give you a little bit more background about the scientific themes here, so phenotypic plasticity. Um, this is when you have a single genome, a single DNA code, and different environments, and how does the phenotype, either the appearance or the behavior of that organism, change given that new environment? And plasticity implies change. So if you have a new environment, it can change. If you revert back to the original environment, it can change back. And this little example here is uh, showing Let's say we have this leaf cell with these specialized cells here. This would be in high CO2 and then low CO2, they have more of those specialized cells. So the plant DNA hasn't changed at all, but since the environment has changed, the expression and the types of cells can be uh, changing. And GEMS, um, this is our collaborator, they are really focused on symbioses and looking about how complex symbioses can impact an environment and an ecosystem. So in this diagram, we have this clover, which then has in the roots uh, symbioses with bacteria. And two of our students are gonna talk about plant uh, soil bacteria interactions. That's gonna change the health of the clover. The bees then forage on the clover the bees have their own internal gut microbe, like most animals do, and how do all of these different symbioses change and in inter, uh, the interrelationship between all of them. Um, with that, a quick little background. We've got three speakers, um, and I put here just who their funding sources are, but we really were all integrated together. Um, I'm gonna let these folks come on in. Oh, it's okay. Oh, I know. We changed the time on you. Um, and they're going to tell you about their own projects individually. There's a little bit of time at the end of each of the talks for you guys to ask them questions, but we're going to kind of keep that to a minimum. And then at the end, all four of us will come up. And if you have questions about the program or any of the individual uh, 
talks, you can ask us at that point. So thank you very much. And I'm going to hand this over to Brittany. Hi, everybody. Um, as Britt just stated, uh, my name is Brittany, uh, Brittany Bailey. I am a 2021 Parkland College alumni. Uh, also, as stated, a GEM slash Prex uh, 2021 alumni. And I worked under Ed Shea, who is my uh, graduate mentor, and Adam Dolezal, who was my faculty mentor. And the project or the research that we conducted over the summer asked the question of whether improved diet quality can alleviate harmful effects of pesticides and viruses in honeybees. Okay, so just to ask a couple questions about the research, um, we start with how do the interacting effects of uh, pesticides and viruses in honeybees affect their survivorship? So. Um, does this help their survivorship? Does it hurt their survivorship, et cetera? And then following this, um, are these interacting effects alleviated when honeybees are fed a high quality diet? And so why is this significant? Um, so as we know, uh, especially in the Midwest, uh, agriculture is really important, um, especially U of I, big agriculture school. Um, and bees uh, play a big role in that as they are pollinators. And so we wanna know, um, especially with the reality of co-occurrence between pesticides and viruses in honeybees, how does this affect them? Obviously it probably affects them negatively and how can we help with that? How can we make it better so they are in a better environment? And just to start explaining the experimental design a little bit, um, each trial contains 80 cages that all receive uh, four randomly assigned treatments. Um, and just to go through those, we have a pesticide dose diet and a plain sucrose solution. So that's going to be a treatment where the bees get the pesticide, but no virus. Um, and then we have a control diet uh, with the sucrose solution. So no pesticide, no virus. And then we also have a pesticide dose diet and a 1.5% IAPV solution, so we have our pesticide and our virus in that. And then finally, we have our uh, control diet with our 1.5% IAPV solution, so that's no pesticide with the virus. And so that IAPV, like what's that acronym even mean? Um, this virus is actually called the Israeli Acute Paralysis Virus, and it is actually a model virus among the honeybees um, when used for any sort of research. And the pesticide that was used uh, in both of these trials is called the neonicotinoid thiamethoxam, but also in the proposal we were to later finish uh, using a different class of pesticides, uh, and that's called the pyrethroid lambda sialothrin. And both of these pesticides are just two commonly used pesticides among the uh, agroecosystem. And just to continue with that experimental design, we're going to be seeing whether a uh, high quality diet will help um, alleviate these negative effects. So we are going to be comparing the standard diet, which is the protein supplement, uh, which is branded the Mega B. That's gonna be our low quality diet. And then we have the pollen, which is our high quality diet, specifically the CC Pollen Company brand. And so these honeybees, 35 of them are gonna be in that cube cage right there, about 80 cages, 35 bees in each. And they're gonna be monitored for seven days um, using mortality checks about every 12 hours. So we are gonna go in there and see how many have died at that time period, record it, and continue throughout that seven days. However, at the 72-hour post-infection mark, uh, mortality checks are gonna occur every 24 hours after that as the phenotypic uh, um, resemblance will stop showing as prominently at that point. And as well as at 24 hours post-infection, we're gonna sample three live bees um, on dry ice from each cage, and it's also done at the end of each trial so we can later perform some experience experiments that will be able to uh, 
measure the viral uh, measurements in the honeybee. And so just like any other research, we did come across some troubleshooting um, that stunted our research, uh, kind of gave us a late start. Um, so our 1% IAPV solution that we normally used um, seemed to uh, fail to produce the desired baseline mortality, um, which just means we were looking at about 65% in cage survival and we were seeing something way higher, like 80%. And so we were not going to get any valuable data that would be able to show whether or not there's any significance. So as a result, we had to run a dose response trial where we found that the 1.5% IAPV solution would produce the baseline mortality that we were looking for. And so here are going to be our results. We see that right here is going to be our mega B or our protein supplement trial. And then here we have our high quality uh, B pollen trial. And up here we have the uh, sucrose solution. And over here on this side too, uh, these data points. However, we're really focused on the dotted lines down here because this includes the virus. And more importantly, we want to look at this orange line right here, the dark orange line, and compare that with the dark blue line because this is showing the survivorship of the uh, pesticide and virus in the, oop, excuse me, pesticide and virus in the uh, supplement diet, and this is in the high quality diet. So we are looking at those two, and unfortunately we do s see that there was no significant difference. Um, however, we do have to believe that has something to do with seasonality, which is essentially just um, at the time point of the season in which the honeybees are in at that point in time, they actually build some sort of viral resistance. So that can kind of hurt our results or um, mess with them, kind of skew them. And so further research um, included using pyrethroid, lambda sialothrin, which we are actually currently analyzing that data in the lab. And finally, once it gets a little bit towards the winter, we are going to complete with some uh, QRT-PCR using the sampled bees from the experiment, which is just going to help us uh, see what the viral titer measurements that will show whether there's any viral tolerance or any viral re resistance within the bees. And our, we were funded by the NSF, um, so I'd just like to acknowledge them, as well as my uh, mentor, Ed Shea, for helping me uh, complete this presentation, as well as my fancy graphs. And any questions? We have one question here. Let me go ahead and hand them the lavalier mic. There you go, sir. Any chance you can compare the quality of the honey of your base to a set another base, a Curtis Orchard? I'm sorry, could you repeat that? I'm just a little confused. Comparing the honey? The quality of the honey subjectively of your bees to say that the diet of a the bees from Curtis Orchard. Yeah, we could certain, uh, I'm sure we could probably do something like that. It may not be as controlled though, since uh, we are producing our bees from the college specifically, and we would just be collecting like wild bees out at Curtis Orchard. So I'm not sure it would actually be the, be the same, unfortunately. Okay. Any other questions, folks? All right, I'll come right over. Okay. Um, you mentioned something about protein supplement, and you know, I was just wondering, uh, as someone who's a fan of protein powder themselves, how effective would this be on, and I, well, for, for starters, like, I wasn't here near the beginning, so what protein supplement did you use? Like, was it like, like nitro or, or something like that, or something, and how would I get my hands on this stuff? I mean, <laughs> where where would I find the bees using this stuff so that I can observe those results as well and not take any of it, but just observe, if that makes sense. 
No, yeah, that makes sense. Um, so typically that's going to be produced by just like a mass production vendor, um, but you're probably not going to see that um, in very many places other than some place like a lab. Um, because when I use the term protein supplementation diet, um, it is actually not as good as a bee pollen per se, because the protein supplement, um, there's protein, um, excess protein in the uh, in this kind of diet. However, that's because it lacks macronutrients that pollen would typically have that would be um, more um, preferred for the bee, if that makes any sense. Any other questions, folks? Okay. So is the aim of this research um, as far as application goes to basically figure out a diet to feed like agricultural honeybees to protect them for this or is there an application in like more of ecology? Yeah, so actually it's probably the uh, the first explanation that you used. So uh, we are actually the goal is to later um, actually perform this at like a colony level so we can um, use this as maybe statistical evidence as far as uh, recommending what sort of like diet to uh, feed honeybees and stuff like that, especially for beekeepers. All right, we got one more over here. I get to run off to the other side. I don't feel like stepping over people, so. <laughs> All right, I will just put this in front of you so you can speak into it. Uh, you said uh, during the troubleshooting like area that you wanted to have a certain like uh, mortality rate with a uh, whole virus. Was there a reason why you had to have a certain mortality rate to during this experiment? I may have missed something. Um, yeah, so we actually, um, in the proposal that was uh, made for this research project, um, it actually is cited from a another research paper, I believe, uh, might actually be from another associate in the lab, um, but they essentially um, explain that, uh, excuse me, I just kind of lost my train of thought. Um, but they uh, say that the typical um, mortality or I guess survivorship of honeybees when they are uh, fed this sort of uh, virus should be 65% mortality or 65% survivorship, excuse me. So when we're seeing that it is higher than that, then we can see that there's some sort of uh, resistance or tolerance possibly due to something like seasonality. It looks like we have another question. Oh, looks like we have two. Oh, well, Basically, this is not a question on the research, but your experience with PREX, and I don't know if this is your first research experience or not, but what was the most challenging aspect of the experience, and also what was the most enjoyable or rewarding for your peer age group that's attending tonight? Um, so I think that the most challenging was um, surprisingly not handling all those bees that I have in my hands right there. That was actually more of the easier part. Um, but I would say um, understanding um, or being able to apply the conceptual idea of the research project to like reading something like a proposal or research papers um, because as somebody who is an underclass mourner or quite um, early in their uh, college career at that time, I hadn't read a lot of research. So a lot of it is just getting used to the typical language of being in research. But most enjoyable was probably making connections. I actually have a really good friend that I found in the lab, and I actually have a really good uh, relationship with my mentor and my PI. So I actually now work in the lab and am doing some research continuously because I do go to the U of I now. So thank you. Oh, I, I was just going to say, uh, first off, great presentation. That was super interesting. Um, also, with the, with the virus that you mentioned, I'm not really familiar with it, or I'm not, I was just sitting here and I was like, oh my gosh, I didn't even realize how the bee's immune system works. And so I didn't know if you had a little bit more of like a background on that or like background on the virus. Um, so just basing it off the proposal that again, for the research for this, um, IAPV is just a typical, one of the more um, typical viruses that you're going to see in the honeybee community, um, but also it does target a lot of things that are going to be really important for um, showing phenotypic responses to a virus. So for example, um, reduced worker immunocompetence is going to be like, 
you're going to be able to tell that they're like waddling around and not really like doing exactly what they uh, normally will and um, other like foraging behaviors and stuff like that and they start to look sickly so um, it's just a really good indicator of showing that oh this virus is working it's infecting the bee thank you all right anybody else with questions okay it looks like we are ready to move on to our next speaker let's give Brittany another round of applause thank you all right so you're, on, you're using the handheld again? Right, okay, perfect. Okay, good evening everyone. My name is Suhyun Lee, and um, I'm currently a junior in U of I, um, studying molecular and cellular biology. Um, I studied at Parkland for about a year and transferred to U of I last year, so I'm, yeah. So I'm currently junior right now. And I was supposed to be joining Prax program last summer, but due to the pandemic, the program got canceled. So I have to rejoin this year. Um, but since I was in Korea during um, this summer, I had to um, participate in this program remotely, unlike other participants. So my summer work is a little bit different from what other students have done since they have been working in the lab physically during summer but I was doing mostly computational analysis back in my home. Um, before I begin to start describing my project, I wanna briefly um, share my uh, experiences with the Prax program. I think it was spring 2020 when I first found out this program and it was my um, general chemistry professor, Dr. Carlson and general biology professor, Dr. Um, Professor Wilson, who recommended me to uh, join the Prax program. And um, yeah, that's all, and there were several um, strengths in this program, and I think some of them could be like you can work in the physically, you can work physically in the lab, and you can get to know the research professors, colleagues, and graduate students who have similar interests with you. And I think one of the main strengths could be like you can earn definitely a lot of stipend. <laughs> Um, but um, out of all, but the main strength that I think with the Prex program was you can gain a lot of knowledge in the science field and definitely you can um, learn what it's like working in the lab as an undergraduate researcher. For me, um, my personal challenge was definitely time differences since I was uh, working in South Korea. It was like 14 hour differences. I had to stay up all night and uh, <laughs> join the meetings, talking with other participants as well. So it was pretty tricky, but I think I managed to do it. So um, let me start um, describing my project. I work in Dr. He's lab um, during summer and I mostly collaborated with one of the postdoc students named Mario. And our main focus was to design a particle to explore the quality of genetic or sequence data of a bacteria named Ansifer malati. And in order to, in order to um, explore the quality of the data, we had to um, compare the sequence similarity against the public databases of bacteria using BLAST tool and other tools such as custom Python, R scripts, and Excel. And after doing all these procedures, we would estimate the contamination level of Ansifer malati in our lab database. So I wanna briefly um, explain what our lab was interested in. So there is one type of bacteria called nitrogen fixing bacteria, and we shorten it to N fixing bacteria as well. And this type of bacteria has a symbiotic relationship or mutualism with its host plants. So we normally think that bacteria is something bad. That's why we use antibacterial soap or hand sanitizer. But some bacteria do have good things just like this as well. And um, our main focus is the rhizobacteria, which is one of the various N-fixing bacteria. And this resides within the nodule of legume plants and it utilizes sugar, which is the product of photosynthesis of the plant, to convert the nitrogen in the atmosphere into NH4+. And rhizobacteria would then provide the um, fixed nitrogen to the legume plant so that the plant can grow um, by itself. So it's like basically the bacteria and the plant are gi giving benefits to one another. And our lab is interested in this mutualism between rhizobacteria and the legume plants. And in order to study this, um, 
mutualism, we need to definitely study the rise of bacteria. And in order to research the bacteria, we need the um, sequence data. Um, in our purpose, the sequence data refers to the nucleic acid sequence, or we could shorten down to DNA sequence. And in DNA sequence, it is definitely the alignment of DNA bases. We have four types of DNA bases, A, T, G, and C. So the sequence data that we're uh, we researching are alignments of A, T, G, and C, which are the DNA bases. Um, so, so here's the question. So why do we have to evaluate the contamination level of the data? So how come the data is contaminated? So there are various ways that the data could be contaminated. One of them could be happening when the lab researchers are extraining rhizobacteria from the plants. Since, um, you know, all, we're not always perfect. Some researchers can cause problems while extracting DNA from the plants. Contamination could happen there as well. And um, sometimes um, we normally send the DNA to the sequencing facilities where they would um, send us back with the computer-based data. And those facilities are not only working with our lab's data, but they're working with different hundreds of different lab's data as well. So contamination could, might be happening as well. Therefore, we definitely have to evaluate um, the contamination level of the data that we get from the facilities. Because um, if we're using our contaminated data in our future research, definitely we will be getting the false res result, which is not an optimal way of doing research. Um, and actually, Dr. Heath and other professors and researchers discovered, recently discovered that there are other types of rhizobacteria other than Ensipermolinati residing uh, within the legume nodule. So our, so me and Mario, our main focus was studying Ensipermolinati, so we should definitely find out whether our data is related to Ensipermolinati or not. That's why we have to evaluate the contamination level of our data. So um, this is a method we haven't gone through in the summer. This picture, um, it, um, this image shows us the mutualism between legume plant and rhizobacteria. We will get extract DNA from the rhizobacteria and we will send this um, DNA sample into the sequencing facilities and they will send us back with these uh, computer-based data, as you can see. As I mentioned before in the previous slide, the sequences are containing A, G, T, and C, which are the basis of DNA. Um, normally, when they send us back with this data, there are hundreds of other information regarding the sequences, such as quali quality information, names, such as things. But we use a customized Python script to uh, eliminate all of those um, additional information that are not necessary in our work right now. So we are only going to use with these um, sequences of DNA bases. And we, are, we're, we have to figure out whether they have contamination or not. So we're going to compare this, um, our experimental data with the um, public database, bacteria database by using BLAST tool. So public bacteria database <laughs> contains lots of um, um, DNA sequences of bacteria, and by comparing with these, with um, the public database and the our experimental database, we ha we're going to figure out whether this data is related to Ansfermolinati. And after uh, repeating all of those procedures and custom uh, using R scripts, um, Python scripts, and Excel, we can finally get this type of graph here. And this is a bar graph and the pie chart. Um, these are like same things. And um, this is one of the examples of the results that I have um, got in the summer. And as you can see, the blue parts in the um, graph and the chart are related to matches um, with the Ansifer Molilati. Um, around 80% of the matches were related to Ansifer Molilati. So it was like 70, 80%. So we concluded that this type this sample could have possible minor contamination since it was not like 90% matches. However, uh, Mario and I uh, concluded that still we are, it, this sample is still eligible for future work in our lab. Um, this, could, this result can be varied by um, researchers. Some researchers could say that since this is around 75%, um, 80% matches, we shouldn't be using this data in our lab. However, some researchers, just like us, could say this is fair enough and we could still use this data in our lab. So it really depends on what project you're working on and who you're working with. 
So I have re uh, repeated this same procedure um, several times. There were several um, mistakes that have gone through since we're using computer, we're using the command codes. If you just press one, one error code in there, everything is um, going wrong and you have to uh, start again the hours of um, matches. So um, I have assessed the contamination level of more than 10 strains of rhizobacteria in our lab database. And except the, sam um, the result that I have shown you in the previous slide, most of the um, samples that I have assessed were like 90, more than 90% matches with the encephalomyelitis strain. So pretty, there were no um, contaminated data in, our, in my research work. Um, at, then after figuring out, um, so our lab will be using um, the uncontaminated data for the future work and for other lab members. Um, we have achieved um, a protocol to evaluate the levels of contamination in the sample of sequence data of Encephalomyelitis, which can be applied to any other future projects or works in our lab. And this protocol will only give us candidate contaminants for future decision. Since this is not like 100% confident method, uh, we couldn't um, confidently say that this is contaminated or not. But we're just using this protocol to make sure that we're not using contaminated data in our future work. For future work, we could probably standardize the methods and create a manual for contamination detection for the lab database, or we could um, use the same method with other bacteria or different strains as well. Yeah, um, this uh, was, um, was supported by NSF. I, I wanna show special thanks to Dr. Heath and Mario and our PIs as well. This is report says, and any questions? Thanks for your patience, folks. I'll bring the uh, microphone over to our first question asker. I'll just put it right onto you. So your uh, experiment was uh, rid of contaminants. What did you guys use to like sterilize everything that you were using to make sure that nothing, nothing like no outside bacteria was getting involved? Um, so I wasn't involving in the process of extracting DNA, so I couldn't really answer that question, but probably there would have been a lot of sterilization method and aseptic technique to um, protect the contamination. Anybody else with questions? Oh, okay, just one moment. So you said that you were over in Korea. So what would you say was the hardest part of being in, of working with two different time zones? Um, definitely it was hard. And since I had to stay out all night um, to attend the meetings and to attend the lectures or talk with the professors, um, it was definitely hard, but, um, and, but um, yeah, I managed to do it. And I, I would probably take sleep in the mornings so a different time show, but yeah, it, um, it was pretty hard, but I think it was worthy. Okay. Um, is this sort of data analysis to determine contamination like a common practice or was it more of something that? Um, this was, um, this protocol was mostly developed by uh, my pro postdoc student, Mario, so I'm not sure if this protocol could be applied to common practice, but I'm pretty sure that we can use the same method um, to evaluate other bacteria as well. Okay, just one moment. I was just, I was just wondering, um, you said you were using Python and R, and I was wondering, were there pr specific tasks that the Python was was more preferable for and specific tasks for R, like w um, what particular task were they were they accustomed for? Um, so for R, it, for R is like for making graphs and charts and making the, getting the statistical values. For Python scripts is for like 
as I mentioned before, uh, when we are getting the data from the sequencing facilities, not only they um, not only they send us back with the um, A, G, and T, C alignments, but also the quality information, names, other sorts of information of um, bacteria data. So we are not gonna use that information while we're doing this work. So we use Python script to get rid of get rid of all of those uh, unnecessary information in our work. Other questions, folks? All right. Well, thank you very much, Suhyun. Thank you. All right. Hi. Um, my name is Faye Smith. I was a participant in the GEMS program this summer. Um, I'm in my second year at Parkland College. I study biological sciences, and I worked with my faculty member. His name is Dr. Anthony Yonarell, and then my graduate mentor was Kevin Ricks. So this is just a little bit about GEMS. Um, I found out about the GEMS program during my spring 2021 semester in my biology class. It was one of the few classes that I had in person for a lab, and Dr. Carlson actually came in and talked about it. I thought it was really interesting and gratefully I was accepted for the summer. Um, doing undergraduate research has many benefits. The biggest, I think, is it allows you to gain lab experiences that aren't available in classroom learning labs. And the hardest parts were the countless amounts of dishes. I did not know how many dishes you had to do in science experiments. I had dishpan hands for the first two weeks. And the feelings of the imposter syndrome. I wanted to talk about that a little bit. Since I was a freshman when I started the program, the imposter syndrome is when people just don't feel like they're capable or start doubting their capabilities in their field. And so since I was surrounded by people who, this is their life work and this is what they love to do, and you know, I was a little nervous at times, but everybody was super nice. So I, <clears throat> sorry. So this summer, I wanted to look at the rhizobia's impacts on plant germination under wet and dry conditions. And I also was looking at phenotyping 28 different rhizobia strains based on how they affect the plant when they're dealing with drought or flood conditions. I also wanted to look at a few phenotypic traits associated um, with rhizobia, such as the ideal moisture needs, which is just do they like more water or do they like drier conditions? <clears throat> and I also wanted to look at biofilm production. So this is just a little bit of background. The system I was working in was clover plants, which I have pictured here. Some of y'all may have them growing in your backyard. And I wanted to look at the microbial communities, such as rhizobia, can assist in maintaining plant fitness. Um, rhizobia are bacteria that live in the nodules and roots of legume plants. So here's just a little image. These are the little nodules. This is a uh, plant root. And the rhizobia live in here. And then these are some of um, clover plants. So why is this important? Well, people try and deny it, but we are dealing with climate change. And these environmental changes are presenting um, plant and animal populations with a whole new set of challenges because they're dealing with warmer temperatures or changes in precipitation. And rapid evolution is commonly used to counteract environmental stressors, but it's been shown that interactions with microbial communities are also a resource that they can use to combat these environmental changes. So um, I did two different assays, mainly during the summer. I did a germination assay. I had 28 different strains of rhizobia. And I did about 10 reps, five of them wet and five of them dry. I inoculated rhizobia in them, and then I counted how many popped up for about seven days. And then I also did a biofilm assay, which gave me lots of problems. But I had 28 strains and six reps and then a sterile control gradient. I let them grow for about 48 hours and then measured how much biofilm was produced. So the influence on germination of clover plants by rhizobia strains was different under wet and dry conditions, but it wasn't directly associated with biofilm production, but more so the phenotypic traits of rhizobia themselves. <clears throat> I still want to investigate what is catalyzing these compositional and functional changes in rhizobia, and I also wanted to look at the biofilm production's relation to plant fitness. So over here, these are the magenta pots. These are most of the dishes that I had to do in the first two weeks. I washed out 500 of these, and yeah. And then over here on the side, I have the 96 well plate pictured for my biofilm assay. I did lots of troubleshooting for it, but anyway. so. 
this is the graph I wanted to show. So this is the percent germination of the clover plants under wet and dry conditions. So on the left side, we have the wet, and on the right side, we have the dry. And this is the percent germination. And each of these uh, colored lines are a different strain. So as you can see, this purple one right here, it does pretty good under wet conditions. Um, when it comes to germination, but then if you follow it down here, when it's presented in a dry condition, it's not producing as much germination. And the same thing with these ones up here, like this blue one, it has a very big difference. So the influence on germination of clover plants um, by rhizobia strains was different between wet and dry conditions, but like I said, it wasn't directly correlated to biofilm production. Um, Changes in microbial communities are influencing plant fitness, but other drought tolerant traits besides biofilm seem to be present. So I really would like to investigate the role of biofilm in um, drought response. And right now my lab is currently working on a generational experience, experiment to see the functional changes in these microbial communities as they form new generations. And I also wanted to look at the identifying the functional changes through different generations of rhizobia microbes. And then I have this cute little image of a little bacteria. And that's pretty much it. Um, I was funded by the National Science Foundation. I'd also like to give a big thank you to my research lab and for Dr. Carlson and Nate for, you know, helping me out through the program. And those are some references and questions. Thank you for listening. All right, folks, who has questions for Faith? Okay, I'll be right over. Um, this is more of kind of like a, a comment um, than a question, but mm -hmm. I was just going to recommend a dishwasher uh, yes. for the dishes, you know. <laughs> um, and also with the imposter syndrome, too, like, I definitely have talked to other, like, science people about it, too. And, you know, as a freshman, I totally get or I, you being a freshman, I totally get it. Um, but I just push for, you know, encouragement. Women in STEM, that's Period. so awesome. So you got this. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, no problem. Great yeah, presentation. Was, thank, you. thank you. That was um, very comforting to, like, have my, even my faculty member, um, my faculty mentor, even when he gets talks, he says he gets nervous. He deals with the imposter syndrome sometimes. So that was very comforting to see that people in all levels of academia still deal with it. So. All right. Um, you mentioned the uh, questioning the role of like biofilm production during mm -hmm. the drought response. So are we dealing with the same uh, development of biofilm that we'd see in like the mouth, aka like plaque and all that stuff? Um, no. So, I mean, it's like a similar concept, I guess. But if we go through like the different strains, since we have different ones, um, they're producing different amounts of biofilm. Um, well, did I break it? I don't know. <laughs> I will go look. Sorry, technical difficulty. No problem. You just keep talking. Okay, anyway. But um, the biofilm production varies between which strain of rhizobia we're looking at. And what I wanted to investigate was how the ideal moisture content is related to how much biofilm each of these strains are producing. So it's a similar concept to the mouth producing plaque, but just more in plant bacteria. I don't know if that really explained it too well. Yes, there we go. So... This strain up here, this pink one, when it's in wet conditions, it seems to be producing more biofilm than when it was produced, um, introduced into dry conditions. And these changes in um, microbial communities has resulted in specialized communities. So some of them can only tolerate high moisture contents while some of them can only tolerate low moisture contents. And that impacts um, their biofilm production as well. Right over there. Um, so how does the biofilm interact with the plant? Is that what's present inside the nodules? Or? Oh, so biofilm um, is thought to help the plant tolerate drought. Since these um, rhizobia do live on nodules in the roots, the biofilm is thought to coat the root and help them retain water. And so that's why it's something that I really wanted to look at because it is dependent on whether they are in wet and dry conditions. I'll go ahead and get this in front of you. So you can <laughs> Thanks. Um, so you're saying that the biofilm should help the plant survive 
a drought. But what this is saying is that um, the biofilm is more likely to be produced in wet conditions versus dry. Um, did you come to any conclusion of how the biofilm helps um, during drought conditions? So um, it's not strictly that I, the biofilm is produced more during wet conditions. It really depends on the rhizobia, the specific rhizobia strains and the traits that it has. But sometimes um, when I was working on the biofilm assay, dependent on how much water it would, um, rhizobia would start trying to produce biofilm earlier to try um, and combat the drought that they were experiencing. So more biofilm would be produced earlier than like at a steady rate. Does that make sense? Okay, I'm sorry. You don't need to apologize. Any other questions, folks? Okay. Is, is there a break point where too much carbon dioxide would cause your nodules to break down? Um, that actually wasn't something that I investigated in my research, but it is a very interesting question. Um, that's something that I should definitely look into. All right. Go ahead, Mindy. I'm just curious. I saw the 96 well plate. I know the pain of working with those. Yes. But what were you actually measuring to determine amount of biofilm? I was curious on the procedure and what you were actually testing for. Okay. So we had a general buffer solution that we would uh, place into all the wells. And then we inoculated the different rhizobia strains. We um, tried to space them out so that there wouldn't be like um, problems with spatial space spacing. But um, then we allowed them to grow. Um, incubated so then they would produce biofilm at that point and where I ran into the most trouble was that you have to wash the excess solution off and my biofilms were getting dislodged and then there was condensation forming on the top of the lid so when I went to go put it on the spectrometer it was seeing like there's stuff there when it's really just water so but um this was an assay that I didn't get to run as many times as I had liked to because my plates ended up being on back order. So I had wanted to run it a few more times, but I just allowed the biofilm and the different streams to form on the cells and I mean the walls in the bottom of the wells. Mm -hmm. Any other questions for Faith? All right, let's give her another round of applause, folks. All right, well, Dr. Carlson, what would you like to do with your uh, presenters here? Yeah, so I think we have a few minutes that if the four of us wanna go up, if there are any questions that you have for any individual speaker or questions about summer research experiences or PREX in general, oh, I could answer right. those. Yep. Come up here with me, ladies. You folks can go right there in front of the ring. So yeah, if there are any, uh, um, just a few minutes for any last questions for any of our speakers or about the program. All right, I'll bring it over there. Just <laughs> one moment. Just go ahead and have this right under your chin, please. Yes, thank you. Um, I just had a quick question for Su Young. Um, I know you spoke a lot about um, mutualism with uh, bacteria and plants, and I was wondering if you knew any other like general types of mutualism, because I thought that was pretty cool, uh, the interactions. Oh, so you're asking about general mutualism? Um, so I was, I was mainly focused on rhizobacterium legume plants. So I'm not really sure about other types of mutualism, but yeah, basically mutualism is um, giving benefits to one another. So um, what I felt was interesting is that we mostly feel bacteria as a bad things, but in this type of research and in this type of relationship, the bacteria is giving benefits to the plants and the, plant is, and the plants are giving be uh, benefits to the bacteria as well. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, okay. Go ahead and switch to the later slides. Go ahead. Hey, um, so what sort of things are taken into consideration for uh, an applicant applying to the PREX program? Thanks for that question. So um, one thing I would do, if any of you guys are Parkland students, I am on the first floor of L, and I also have some of my office hours in the science commons. So come talk to me. Uh, we also have some papers and flyers and stuff in the science commons. But um, 
Uh, if you go to our website, which is up there, there is a page about how to apply for PREX, and I think it's pretty standard for a lot of programs. So in all of them, you're going to need at least one letter of recommendation, preferably from a science faculty, but it doesn't have to be. Um, some programs require a couple. You also are going to need a personal statement. So that's talking about um, why you're interested in participating, what your career goals are, but also any challenges that you've had in your life, how you've overcome them, um, basically giving us a better idea of who you are. And I would say that's the most critical part of your application. We also ask for a transcript. Um, but all those things are surface level except for the personal statement. So that's where we really get to hear about who you are. We do ask you guys to list some of kind of your preferred lab matches because we have a list of them on the website. Um, and we can, we go through, we look who looks like a good candidate, but also who might be the best match for the program, for the mentors who are available. Um, but it is competitive. So all of these programs are very competitive. Um, so I would say one, if you don't get in, don't feel like that's the end and you're not worthy, right? It's just the pool of people and the pool of mentors and all of that. And two, I would say don't apply for just one, that there's a lot out there. And these types of programs are in all disciplines of sciences. So this is a biology program, but there are ones in clinical sciences there's astronomy, there's engineering, there's all sorts of different ones. Um, there are some unpaid opportunities out there, but these, these ones that are paid are great because you really can just focus on that and not try to balance all your other responsibilities that you need when you're a working student. So did you have any additional questions to that? Okay, I would definitely say if you think you might be interested, but you're thinking you might not be qualified enough or good enough or have enough background, you know, this just goes right to what Faith was saying, is just go for it. Like, you're not going to get into it if you don't apply for it, and you can't let those voices or your inner demons stop you from putting yourself out there. Yeah. Um, on average, how long are people in the program? Like so it's a 10-week program over the summer. Um, and I would say nationally, these types of programs go on typically like eight to 10 weeks long is kind of your standard um, for the different programs that are out there. And you get paid for them. Yes, so the stipend, I would say on average, if we're going to get into details, is about $600 a week. And then if you do need to travel, they will pay for you. They're all over the country, so they will pay for your travel and your housing, uh, and maybe partial food as well. And there's great ones available across the country. Of course, Champaign-Urbana is the best place, but if you wanted to do one in like California or in uh, Colorado, right, in the mountains or something, they're all over the place. So. Right, the P in PREX does not just stand for phenotypic plasticity, it also stands for paid. <laughs> <laughs> there you go, yes. <laughs> You know, and I know we are joking about that, but that's a huge thing, right? How many students at community colleges can participate in this and give up the earnings that you might be getting over the summer, right? So it's like an, an acknowledgement and a support for you to really fully invest yourself, yeah. Any other questions from the group? All right. Go ahead, Erin. It sounds like a lot of you have things that you want to still investigate. So that sounds like you have still a relationship with your lab. Could you talk about that a little bit? Uh, yeah, so I do still work in my lab and I actually just applied and was approved for a continuation of research credit at the U of I because I didn't mention it, but I am a molecular and cellular biology major at the U of I. Um, so I will just be continuing, um, especially during the winter since honeybees aren't really active during this time, I'll just be doing a lot of uh, reading literature on figuring out exactly what I want to conduct, but it will probably still be um, within the reins of Ed's um, nutritional uh, research. 
I still talk to my um, graduate mentor. We usually talk about things like survivor and not so much um, rhizobia, but um, yeah, so I still talk to him and I talk to my faculty mentor. Um, I haven't been working with my lab since I am a Parkland student still, but working in my lab definitely opened me up to um, different areas of science that I think I want to investigate. Like when I did my experience, I learned about rhizomicrofungi, and I think that's a really nice symbiotic model to look at. And so it was really, yeah, so that's pretty much all I've been doing. Um, for my case, um, thankfully, um, Dr. Hill and Mario uh, per, um, gave me opportunity to work in the fall semester as well, but um, there are several personal issues and I had to take over credit <laughs> hours and, uh, I'm, and I'm, I'm actually in the MCB honors program, so still, I'm, since I'm the honors program, I have more chance to work in a more like medical related lab since I'm um, thinking about pursuing my career in the med school. So. Um, yeah, so thankfully, but Dr. Heath and uh, Mario gave me the opportunity to work in the fall semester. I don't know if he answered this, and I just maybe didn't understand it, but the harmful effects of pesticides versus viruses, I mean in viruses in honeybees, did you do any uh, research on how the honey affected humans? Um, no, we did not do any research on how the honey affected humans. Um, this is essentially um, because honey bees produce honey, um, they also consume it, but it was essentially just to uh, assess their health um, and see how that, um, how pesticides and viruses affect that and how uh, diet quality can help that. So I hope that answered your question. <laughs> So did you guys all choose your own like places of study? Like if I were to like be in the program, right? And I wanted to also do something pertaining to protein supplements for research purposes, um, would I just be able to go along something that is within that area or how did that, how did you guys go about actually choosing what you were researching? Yeah, so I'm just going to answer generally that on our website we have a list of potential research mentors with a short description of, in general, what a student who's matched with their lab might be doing. And then we ask all applicants to kind of rank your top three. And then as much as possible we try to match you with one of the people on your list or somebody who has a, a, a similar sort of research. But then when the students come, it's really a conversation between them and their mentor about current projects that are happening and where the mentee, where the student could fit into that context. So they do have their own projects, but it has to fit in the umbrella of the host lab. Um, and depending on the host lab, the student who's coming in might have a little bit more input. There might be several different avenues, or it might be a little bit more structured for them, uh, since all of our students are community college students and are in their first or second year, we're not expecting them to come in with some like, you know, really high end proposal because they're really starting off and this is gonna be for the most part their first research experience. So we start them off with something and then the idea is more as the summer goes on and you learn more and more about your system and the research that you're doing that maybe then you can start proposing well, why do we do it this way? Maybe we could do it that way. Or have, I'm starting to see this from my results. Should we maybe investigate what's going on there? Or maybe we could try it this other way. Um, so we do tend to have it as a little bit more structured for, for earlier stage students. But then they are given a choice in the beginning um, about what kind of lab they could be matched with. So, um, I'm not sure, for, for you two, you ended up being with GEMS mentors, so they weren't on the core prex list. And then for Sue Hewn, it was a little bit different because we needed to find a lab that could host her virtually, so that restricted our choices as well. But we'll have, uh, it's a wide range of host labs from more ecological environmental to more biomedical, and, and so we kind of try to match students with their interests within there. 
Just a moment, I'll be over there to answer the questions. Yeah, I get your question asked, but <laughs> okay. Are there a specific number of these research, research opportunities offered per year or how is it determined? Yes, so within Prex we have openings for 10 students typically and we host students from all over the country. So that's part of why it, it's that competitive one. So this year with possible travel restrictions and things like that, we're mostly Illinois students, but we did have two from California and one from Tennessee who could come. Um, but nationwide, like I said, there's tons of these.